You're listening to EdTech Heroes, a podcast that looks at how teachers in today's classrooms can use technology to improve student learning. In each episode, a hero in the world of education will share their story and discuss how innovation can influence the minds of the next generation. Let's jump in. Hello, everyone, and welcome to EdTech Heroes. I am your host, Neff, and today's guest is Adam Juarez. Adam is a teacher on special assignment, or folks in California call it a TOSA, who serves as a technology integration coach leading teachers in implementing technology into their lessons through one-on-one coaching, demo lessons, and professional development. He also previously taught middle and high school world and U.S. history. Outside of the classroom, he's an author and an ed tech coach. Adam, welcome to Ed Tech Heroes. Thanks for having me, and it's a blast. <laughs> Absolutely. So we're happy to have you on any day because you have awesome ideas and have contributed quite a bit to the ed tech world. But it is especially dope to have you on today because we're right on the hills of ISTE, which we talked about in a previous episode. And I hear that you were a featured voice at ISTE. What what does that mean? Uh, you know what? Honestly, I'm still trying to figure out what, what it means. I know I was, uh, I was uh, originally uh, both my wife and I, um, Catherine Goyette, were uh, featured voices, and uh, she got the email first. So, she, so I was celebrating her, and then uh, she looked at me. And she's like, "Well, all my sessions are joint ones with you. How are you not here?" I'm like, "I don't know, but hey, this is awesome." And then, like about an hour later, then I got the email, and I was like, "Oh, this is kind of cool." So I had to really, uh, I had to get a new headshot. So. <laughs> Uh, upgrade my headshots and stuff uh, that was kind of a yeah i'm not sure exactly really what it means i guess they promoted my sessions a little more they were very well attended and mm. uh, it was it was just great to be see people face to face um i probably had more people come up to me than, than a normal isd say hey I, I saw you but but yeah it's a, a huge honor I'm, I'm humbled and grateful for the for the uh, recognition um that isd gave me for this and uh Hopefully that's just good. I'm pretty sure so far it's led to me to meet a lot, new, a lot more new people. That's just mm. going to continue to help me grow. So AC did me a favor. Yeah, absolutely. And I didn't realize that your wife was also a featured voice. What a power couple. Are your kids also going around teaching ed tech sessions too at this point? <laughs> um, they, I've had them co-present with me in the past. They've helped out at different events. We brought our nine-month-old with us on the trip, so she was pretty popular. We did a, um, a book signing at the uh, Spaces EDU booth, and uh, she was right there. We promoted us saying, come get your free signed coffee, and you got to take a picture with, with, with the baby. So she's <laughs> she, she good for, for promotional reasons when it comes to uh, trying to sell that book. Yeah, absolutely. We need to get on the baby's schedule, and maybe we can get her on the podcast as well. Yeah. <laughs> so you talked a little bit about just the amount of people who came up and said hi. And for listeners who have not been to ISTE, it is a massive event, hundreds and hundreds of booths, thousands of educators, lots of sessions, whether they are in-person sessions or poster sessions. It's just an awesome event. And I'm curious, for somebody who has gone to ISTE years and years, what's the draw for educators? Why do they want to keep coming back? Um, usually, first and foremost, it's always like a, it, it's a destination. It, it's like the it's like the Super Bowl for ed tech. It's you look forward to it all year. People, I'm sure, save up for it. They're begging, borrowing, stealing with, with their employers to get them to send them. And I hear a lot of those stories. Like, oh yeah, so they're, they're going to pay for me to go mm -hmm. because it's it's. I mean, there's everything that you could possibly want to learn is there. Now, are you able to learn everything? No, that that's it's a, it's like drinking water of a fire hose, but. The connections you make are just are, are out of this world. I mean, I'll go back to one of my first, uh, I think it was my second ISTE, which is, uh, I believe it was 2018. For me, it was very surreal where I'm, I'm walking into the convention center there in Chicago and I see getting off a bus is at first glance, I grew up going to Catholic school, so I grew up with nuns. So at first glance, I see some ladies at, at the corner of my eye getting off a bus that I, I thought they were nuns, but I look over, they weren't nuns. Um, I believe they were from um the country uh, uh Arabian country called Oman hmm. and they were in, the, in their full gear full veil everything and I was like wow this is truly international we have these educators from Oman have come all the way to Chicago for this and it's just like huge cross-cultural blending of, of ideas and 
And cool thing is that they came to one of my sessions, which wow. is awesome, and gave me some feedback. I'm like, man, like uh, Oman's not a country like normally that you know you think you hear about often. And I got to meet people from there, um, and then just from all over the place. That, that's just one example that sticks out about ISTE. It's, it's it's that ability to connect with with people all over the world and just see how how different education is, just not from like state to state, but from country to country. Mm-hmm. If, I love that you brought that up because I think in this day and age, there are lots of opportunities to be able to learn things. And we've talked about them on this podcast. Folks can pick up your book and they can learn from you asynchronously. There is a whole community of educators on Twitter who are sharing ideas, many of them that have been shared at ISTE. So when we think about what you can't get online searching through, it's that connection and that international piece that is at ISTE. And being able to build sort of these lifelong friendships that transform your pedagogy. So I'm I'm so excited that you brought that up. So for folks who are thinking about going to ISTE, that would that's what you have in store. You get to make friends from all over the world. All right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the sessions that you led. And you were crazy poor, prolific with four <laughs> different sessions at ISTE. And we'll start with your session that was entitled Foresee the Future, Lesson Design That Empowers. While it's fresh on your mind for folks that could not attend, can you give us a little bit about what that session was about and a few key takeaways? Oh, uh, yeah, that, that was one of the sessions I co-presented with my wife, Catherine. Um, it's uh, straight out of our book. So mm. we, uh, we have one of our, our big quotes for the book is that if you plan with the four C's in mind, the tech will take care of itself. So, um, again, uh, four C's are uh, creativity, collaboration, communication, and critical thinking. And we, we kind of uh, built our philosophy out, out of coaching teachers to design their lessons with that. And then when you start thinking with that lens, the tech starts coming, we say, uh, organically. We think mm. about the organic method. And it's, it's, the organic method is springs out of the four Cs. So uh, if I'm playing with the four Cs in mind, maybe I, I don't have tech. But you know what? That's fine because I'm worried, worried about what the students are doing and how they're going to engage with each one, of, each one of those Cs. But as you connect with more people, you build your PLN, you learn more, your, your ed tech toolbox gets deeper and deeper. As you start playing with the four Cs, you start thinking of ways that you can use uh, different tech platforms and apps and strategies to meet a learning goal. So what it is, it's more learning and learner centered rather than tech centered mm. or teacher centered. So that's kind of what we kind of coach teachers through. We give them tam- time to kind of just design their own mock lesson using our process. And we got some really good feedback on it. That sounds awesome. And we've talked about that quite a bit in terms of allowing tech to fill the mold and push student learning versus it being the basis of student learning. I want to unpack that a little bit more. When a teacher is, let's say, building a lesson on the Bill of Rights, I know both of us have taught middle school uh, history, how might they think about building a lesson like that while infusing creativity and collaboration? Creativity is, I think, one of the C's that I um... In my experience, I think it confuses people a lot. I think they have to be artistic and creative, mm-hmm. which they can. But the way I coach teachers is what are the kids going to create? What are they producing as an artifact of learning? So they, we kind of have them start there. It's kind of like almost a little bit of backward mapping, like or what's that end goal that you want them to, pr- to produce? And, you know, when, then that, that spurs that, co- that coaching conversation. You know, maybe I want them to create a video. Hey, we could use Screencastify for them to make a to, to make a video. All right, so that kind of leads to the creativity piece, and then we start working individually with the other Cs. So if we're going to get into collaboration, okay, if they're going to be working in partners, one thing we always say is that a lot of kids don't really know what true collaboration is. They think, okay, I'll do my slide, you do the slide, I'll say my part, you say your mm-hmm. part, and boom, that's collaboration. That's not collaboration. That's working individually, but kind of on the same team. So how how are the kids going to give each other feedback? on their work. They should have an equal claim in each step of the creative process of, of what they're building. And then that leads into to the critical thinking. Well, how are they going to problem solve? What problems are they solving as they uh, as they are in that creative process? Um, and then that leads also leads to, to the communication. Another one that gets uh, communication a lot gets confused with collaboration. So it's not, are we talking while we're working? It's like the communication is, will 
what we produce? Is this going to be only for the eyes of the teacher or will it go beyond the four walls of the classroom? Is mm -hmm. there going to be an authentic audience? Um, and, and another huge piece of the communication is the feedback loop between students and teachers. How often are the teachers giving targeted feedback on the fly, giving that, that true formative feedback while they're working? So if the feedback loop is robust, that final product is going to be great because you were coaching them up mm -hmm. all during the whole process. And when you grade it at the end, you already know it's quality. It's not going to be an autopsy where I'm a, your paper is dripping with, with red ink and then you don't want to go back. It's not an autopsy anymore. It's going to be a true uh, organic final product. Absolutely. So I, I guess if we go back to this idea of this sample assignment of attempting to understand the Bill of Rights, we might have folks build out a script in Google Docs collaboratively with a partner. And as a teacher, I might be able to go in and start to provide comments and thoughts and all of that. And then by the time they get to that final product, that might be a Screencastify video that looks very similar to what I would like them to produce because they've had that feedback. They've had that opportunity to be able to really go in and infuse those four C's. I, I really like that tidbit there in thinking through what our feedback is able to produce for students so that it doesn't all come at the end. It really does come in a formative fashion. Yeah, definitely. Thinking back to the Bill of Rights, um, again, just thinking of some of the activities I've done over the years that are kind of forced these views, I'm definitely um, big on the, um, we've done it where they had to create silent skits that kind of show e each of the, the first 10 amendments. Mm -hmm. So we've done a one where um, I call it human stop motion, where what the kids would take, would have to act out frame by frame, still shot by still shot, you know, something to do with, uh, let's say for, let's say the second amendment, the, the right to bear arms. So kind of take about seven to 10 uh, still shots of, of what that could look like. And then they can stitch it together in Google Photos as an animated GIF. Mm. And then that leads to a short presentation explaining each one. The kids can see how they've been created. So that, that's just one of probably dozens of ways I've tried to get kids to uh, engage in the four C's when it comes to the Bill of Rights. I love that idea. I kind of wish I still had my seventh graders in front of me so we can, we can try that out. So four C's is not all you talked about at ISTE. You also had a session called Rock the Shells with Google Classroom. <laughs> First question, are you an LL Cool J fan? Is that where that came from? Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly where I got it from. You know, for a couple of years, I, I, I get like at least two or three sessions accepted by Google. And I, I got a dry spell the last couple of years. I'm like, hey, what's going on here? I, I'm like, I, I got to remember, this is Google. You got to come up with the, with the creative, creative uh, session title. So I'm like, all right, this is the Google Classroom. I rock the shelves perfect. And on my title slide, I, I, I found this picture of LL Cool J and, uh, with his arm around Eminem. But I superimposed my face on Eminem's face, <laughs> and I had and I had the the beat playing in the background as people walked in. So I, I had to get real googly and creative with that. But yeah, that, that I was on Google Classroom that that session. That's awesome, and I love the full commitment. the The next thing that you needed was maybe like a Kangol hat so that it yeah. was it was super legit. So the session apparently was about developing shells in Google Classroom. And I'm going to fess up that I actually don't know what that is. So can you tell me what a shell is in Google Classroom and also why that's so important? Um, I want to go back to probably, if I go back to about 2017 or 18, I started doing some work with our local county office, doing some uh, training pre-service teachers. And they were using Canvas. And when they they kind of onboarded me, they uh, they sent me some links. They said, here, here, here are some Canvas shells that you can use to build your own Canvas classroom. Mm. And it was very helpful. They were like templates that I could use with already pre-made, some had a syllabus in it, some had assignments, just a, a way to kind of see what a, a Canvas classroom could look like because I'd never used it before. So as I kind of spent a couple of years teaching a couple of courses using Canvas, I, I started thinking I could do this with Google Classroom. And it was about this time last year, I started developing this with our high school uh, US history department. and. Well, I started seeing that we have a lot of common assignments that we do. We have mm. obviously common assessments and a lot of assignments that we all kind of like like to do that, that, that are the same. So I figured, you know, instead of everyone having to go into their Google Drive and then they, they, they need to attach these documents and type out the instructions, why don't we create, I created a uh, a shell, a classroom that was just us as all as co-teachers 
and I created template assignments that have the instructions already built in there. They're, they're going to be the same every time we use it. And I have the instructions translated it side by side, English and Spanish for our, for our, our English learners. And then uh, Google Docs or the slides or whatever were already built in there as templates. And then each teacher in the department could reuse it and they could edit it if they needed to. But all they have to do is just change out the, the, the week and the date and they're ready to go. And, and it cut the lesson plenty of time dramatically. I also started using a different version that was just for myself that I was the only teacher in where I had all about two dozen or so activities that I've used over the years and all the templates were built in. So when I went to my actual classrooms, when I was planning for the week, I could plan a week long instruction in, in minutes because I would just go reuse post and just change the name, open the document, change the name of the document, add a few things, and it was, it was there. And it, it totally changed the game for me when it came to lesson planning. I mean, probably cut it in, at least to cut my lesson planning time in half. So again, I had two different types of shells. There's the one that are that we share that have um, templates. Actually, there's three types of shells. There's one that's just my, for me, my templates, mm -hmm. one that's shared amongst a department where we have common assessments. So we even put semester finals in there that have rubrics already built in. And all we have to do is reuse and, um, and the rubrics follow along. Our data stays separate from each other and it just makes everything a, a breeze. A third kind of shell I talk about is one that's more curriculum based. Um, when I, I was coaching them, our middle school, um, ancient history and medieval history cl classes, I, I went through their entire curriculum, section by section, chapter by chapter. And I'm sure you're, you're familiar with edu protocols. Mm -hmm. With edu protocols, so I've, I jumped on that, on that bandwagon years ago and I started saying, you know what, I, I, can, I can train them to do this, but you know, I'm not in there enough and they require them to, to really do a lot of planning. So how, I said, how about I do this? I'm gonna take your curriculum, uh, each section, I have like a dozen edu protocols that you could use more than you could ever use in a week, but you can pick and choose. Mm -hmm. And it kind of, so now then I added all those teachers to, as, as co-teachers, and then they can just pick and choose and reuse whichever ones they want to use based on the curriculum. So it's aligned to the curriculum. Um, and it's, uh, I've gotten some good feedback on that. So it's definitely the, the shells, the class shells, which are inspired by canvas. So definitely, um, it, it helps with uh, collaboration amongst the department and the PLC. So if, if I haven't done that for you, that, that's the work that you can do in your PLC. Let's set up these common activities and assessments that we can all use. Because as my good friend Joe Marquez says, um, teaching is a collaborative sport. For sure. And I want to go back for a second. If there are folks who are listening who are not familiar with edu protocols, will you give us a quick definition there? Edu protocols originally developed by my good friends John Crippo and Marlena Hebern, and they're lesson frames or templates that can be reused for any subject matter, for any grade level. The instructions stay the same. It's drip, as John likes to say, it's dripping with the four C's. And but what, what happens is that the, the information changes each time you use it. It's all about having multiple reps uh, and doing it over and over and getting kids used with, used with that system. And you'll see the engagement go through the roof. They talk about uh, teach better. And what's the tagline? It's uh, uh, work less, teach better. So it's something like that. And it definitely, it's the truth because your lesson plan time goes out the door. Like, you don't, like man, I'm already done. And, and the kids are super engaged. It, mm -hmm. It's amazing. So, And if folks wanted to get a look at an edu protocol or start to familiarize themselves with that, where would they go? Where would they find that stuff? If they go to eduprotocols.com. There's a tro trove of free templates. They have four books already. They have a edu protocols field guide, volume one, volume two. They have a math version. They have one for administrators. So there's four out right now. And any day now, they're dropping a social studies version. So that will be the fifth book in, this, in the series um, coming out very soon. Very cool. Very cool. Sounds like there is quite a bit to dig in there. So I love this concept of a shell in Google Classroom. And I like that you have given us multiple versions of what this could look like, right? Like you could do it just for yourself. And I don't know, the summer seems like an awesome time to think through this, to look back at the Google Classroom instances that you had in the previous year and pick out those things that you know that you're going to reuse. And if you've got some folks that are down to help out, you can have this collaborative shell that you spoke about that you sort of spearheaded. And when I think about adding those edu protocols into this Google Classroom shell, 
it almost sounds like that is something that you might be able to collaborate with the entire building on because those edu protocols are not necessarily subject specific. They could be, but they certainly don't have to be. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. So um, I have the ones that are aligned directly to the curriculum. Then I have my basic template ones that I use for myself when I'm teaching people uh, for the first time how, how to implement them or if I'm designing my own lesson from scratch. I go to that template one that's just blank templates. Very cool. Very cool. So I guess folks have something to do after listening to this podcast of finding their posse to be able to create a show. So apart from the sessions that you led at ISTE, how many sessions do you think you attended just to learn from other brilliant educators? Honestly, um, I spent a lot of my time poster sessions. I I didn't have a lot of time to go to sessions. Um, ISTE is hard to get in a session. It's so spread out. Mm. And by the time you, you're rushing to a session, they have closed it already. I honestly only attended one session. And it was my wife's session in the, in the Google Teaching Theater. So that was the only one I truly really attended. But I spent a lot of time really going through the poster sessions. Mm-hmm. Um, I saw a lot of things on, um, it was like uh, coding and STEM and stuff. So I'm not very good at that or familiar with it. I was just trying to pick up ideas that I can bring back to my team. I spent a good portion of the time in the, uh, just going through that massive expo hall. Absolutely. All the different companies on the, you know, I, I keep a, a little uh, Google keep note throughout the year from the teachers that I serve and some of the, my fellow instructional coaches. And I, I see what, what they're, what they're looking for. And I kind of will go through the expo hall looking for different companies. Mm-hmm. They may have an app or an idea that is good for what they're doing. So I, I'll bring back swag for them and, and stuff like that. And again, I get a lot of best you know, learning is just being in the halls. Mm. I bump into people. Hey, I know you from Twitter. This is awesome. <laughs> All right. And we start talking and then we start sharing ideas. And, you know, I'll say, here, I'll add you to my edge protocol show if you want to, you want to practice with it. And they'll, they'll, they'll give me some ideas. And it's just those natural organic encounters is where I, I, I get the most out of ISTE. Yeah. 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 So many different ways to learn, right? Sessions, hanging out in the expo hall, finding random people. I, ISTE in Philadelphia had one of my best conversations at the Panera Bread that was adjacent to uh, the actual expo hall. So of all the conversations and learning that you had at ISTE, can you give us two or three highlights, things that you took away? My eyes were definitely really deeply opened with with Adobe. Adobe has hired some of my best, two of my best friends, two people who were in my wedding, just got hired by Adobe, Lindsay Blass and Martin Cisneros. And Adobe's really taken off with what they're trying to do with their with their creative studio. They're giving away all these Adobe Institutes for free, and it's a, it's a really cool concept of what they're trying to do. So I'm I'm going to be uh, actually working with them in a few weeks down here in Southern California at one of their first uh, institutes, and they're going to kind of train me on, on on what they're doing. So I'm really excited to learn that whole Adobe thing. I mean, my, my flag's pretty firmly planted in, in the Google area, but it's really I'm glad to kind of branch out and, mm-hmm. and really learn the, those Adobe tools and, you know, learn that and bring that back to the teachers and students that, that I'm serving. But that's definitely, that's probably my, my biggest highlight, just kind of seeing what's out there. I saw from uh, Quizzes has uh, their live whiteboarding feature. That's another thing that I picked up at the Expo Hall that I, I've been asking them to do for a couple of years now. And they, they brought that in there. So I'm really looking forward to bringing that out. Um, I think another one thing highlight for me was, um, the the paper app mm. I first learned about them at Q this spring and I saw them again I didn't get a chance to see them at Q but I, I spent a lot of time picking their brains about what their services are and in a nutshell paper the paper app is it's this um kind of a twenty four seven tutoring service where if your school signs up for it you know kids can have a, a tutor on hand at, at any time and I, I think that's pretty powerful and mm-hmm. I'm gonna explore that a, a little bit deeper. I can see uh, that's uh, definitely uh, easing some pain points with a lot of the kids that I'm serving. Yeah, absolutely. And it's cool that you're able to evaluate all of these tools with the lens of the students that you serve in mind. As you were going through and talking about paper, I, I thought a little bit about the students that I taught back in Miami who were often doing their homework at different times. Some would wake up early to do their homework before school started. Some had jobs and needed to do that, and then they were doing their homework. So this idea of 24-7 help and always being able to have an expert on hand sounds like a really cool one and has the opportunity to help 
the kids that I taught, the kids that you are currently serving in Southern California. So love that sort of lens there. And I guess I would be remiss if I didn't ask, while you were hanging out in the expo hall, did you get a chance to stop by the Screencastify booth? I did. I, I could, it took me a while to find you guys. I mean, I think that that's probably the biggest expo hall that I've ever been in my life. <laughs> I, I heard that that hall, the entire uh, convention center could hold like 300,000 people. Whoa. It, it was just like, it was just this big, long building, three three levels. And then I got the expo hall was just massive. And I kept, I kept looking and looking. I know uh, Jared had told me the I had to look through my emails because he told me the booth number, and then I, I was able to finally find it. It was kind of tucked away. I'm like, oh, finally, I made it. And he's like, yeah, you should go up there and try to get a shirt. And by the time I found you guys, you guys were all out of shirts. So I was a little bummed, but I did, I did, I did pull some swag there and get to talk to some of your your colleagues there at Screencastify. So I did, I did find you guys. All right, that's awesome. After lots and lots of searching, you found the promised land. We'll have to see what we can do about getting you a shirt. Um, definitely. I think U.S. Post makes it all the way out to Southern California. So we'll see what we can yeah, do there. So. <laughs> um, so before we wrap up our discussion, and it's been a really good one all about ISTE, we have a segment here where we ask every single one of our heroes to share some tips and advice for teachers. And I know that you're a fan of Screencastify, so I would love to hear your favorite tip for educational video creators. Oh, man, I'm trying to narrow that down here. I probably have to say is you need to be patient hey. because good quality content that you produce as a teacher is going to take multiple takes. I, I see a lot of teachers get real frustrated, like, you got us a Screencastify thing, and I just can't get it right. and it, and I tell everyone, like anything, it takes practice. For sure. Um, I, I hear from students a lot of times. The students will tell me, oh, Mr., I, I don't like seeing myself on, on camera. I go, you could turn the camera off. You don't have to put yourself there in the bottom. There's just so many you know, ways that you can customize it. But be patient and have a clear focus on what you want to do. A lot of times what I do is I'll tape uh, or I'll take some sticky notes and put talking points where it's on the screen that I can see it, but nobody can. That, that, that usually pretty helpful. I, I try to put it in my, uh, in my line of sight. So it's, it's not totally obvious that, that I'm mm-hmm. looking at my notes, but to just be patient. And then eventually it becomes second nature and you, you can start firing these off just like a pro. It, it just, it practice makes perfect. It, it, it's cliche for a reason, but I've, yeah, I've definitely noticed a lot of people will get a little frustrated at the beginning, but you get over the, those beginning jitters and stuff. And a lot of people are like, oh, I, I'm not used to hearing myself. I, mm-hmm. I sound weird. I go, you remember, you're the only one that thinks you sound weird. You're hearing yourself the way the world is used to hearing you. And that, that's just a, a funny little thing people learn when they first started recording themselves. Yeah, for sure. And, and I'm going to remix that tip a little bit. I, I think especially when educators are taking the time to do multiple clips to potentially edit their videos and make them really good, The cool thing is, is that you can then reuse those. You can put that in a shell as part of an assignment in Google Classroom to go back to that idea. Maybe it's going to be reference material that students are going to use throughout the entirety of the year. So a lot of times it might be hard to think, dang, I don't have 15 minutes or 20 minutes to invest in creating this video. But if we reframe that conversation a little bit and think about how much time you might save from creating that video, then it becomes really, really cool. And the other thing that I'll add is as a secondary teacher, you consistently repeat yourself, right? Like I taught six different periods of the same section. So if it took me 10 minutes to record something and it would have taken me three minutes per class to say it, I've actually saved myself some time because now I can say, you know what, go play that video and I can be sort of rest assured that all of my periods have gotten the exact same information. I'm glad you said that because when I was still still teaching a few courses last year, I haven't taught a live lesson to actual human children (laughs) in I don't know how long because I, I tried doing it at the beginning of last year, and for, I, I guess it's still a pandemic hangover. Their attention span was just, you know, 15 seconds. The, they're off doing other things. They couldn't focus. So I'm like, all right, I need to pull back here. So I went to what I know. I, I, during the pandemic, I was pre-recording all my lessons for asynchronous work. So I figured, why don't I try this? Why don't I do have them work 
synchronously, but in an asynchronous manner. Mm. So what I would do, I would record on Screencastify three to four minute little clips, portions of a lesson. And I would then uh, drop those videos into quizzes lessons. So mm. each little, little segment had its own slide. And then it had a series of uh, checking for understanding questions that, that, that were built in. And it allowed kids to go back and rewind, go at their own pace. So it really allowed them to, you know, the kids who, who needed more time, they could take more time. If they if they're really good at it, they, they get through it a lot quicker. And then the checking for understanding questions that I built in were part of the um, the accountability piece and it held them accountable for, for their learning. So it yeah, definitely a good way to kind of app smash uh, to uh do my favorite apps. Yeah, absolutely. I love a good app smash. And I, I guess the other thing that I'll throw out there is that I, I think that that is such a good learning right in terms of thinking through we're going to have synchronous pieces of our instruction and we're also going to have asynchronous pieces of our instruction but how might we be able to marry those and give students an opportunity to be working on the same thing but just slightly different right like everybody is going through that same quizzes lesson but somebody might be two videos ahead or one video ahead or whatever the case may be so yeah i i absolutely love that and it sounds like it worked and provided an opportunity for students to be engaged when they weren't necessarily engaged with the live lesson. And when I shifted to that model, the first day kids were telling me, oh, mister, this is so much better, <laughs> so much better. I, I can focus. And, um, and, you, and you, if you think about it, you know, the, these kids, every kid today in school doesn't know the world without the Internet. The, this is mm. the, the YouTube and Netflix generation. They're used to having control over what they're consuming. They, they're always used to having a pause button. When I'm teaching a direct instruction live lesson to kids in the classroom, very traditionally, there's no pause button on me. Mm -hmm. And But they're so used to having that control. A lot of times, people on, on our generation will scoff at kids like that. They can't sit still and pay attention. And it's really not the, I'm, I wouldn't say it's, the, it's their fault. It's just the world that they live in. And it's easier for us to kind of roll with their punches rather than the other way around. Yeah, absolutely. A good friend that I actually met at ISTE, Stella Pollard, who teaches over in Kentucky, spends a lot of time talking about that, the power of pause. And a lot of times when we think about video, we think about students being able to rewatch it and that being the power. And that's certainly one of the powers of video. But there is something really cool about a student being able to hear a tough concept, pause it, be able to ponder that. Maybe they're taking notes. Maybe they're trying it for themselves in a math class. And then once they feel like they've really got it down, then being able to play and continue. So yeah, absolutely. Right. And that's, that's what I do. If I'm watching a YouTube video and I want to learn something, I'm pausing that thing every 15 seconds to make sure that I really, really understand. Uh, so it's cool to be able to give that to students. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because, you know, you know, people like you and me, we're very intrinsically motivated to learn and we will pause. But that's something that that's a skill you have to teach kids. Mm -hmm. And it's it's uh, easier said than done. So one thing that I've done, if I go back to my quizzes lesson uh, example, so I have those Screencastify videos built in. And after each video, before they get to a question, I have a slide that says the big stop sign. It says stop, raise your hand and ask the teacher to come over here to check your notes. Because then I can give them feedback on their notes and I can see very quickly if they got those key concepts. And if I approve it, okay, move on, answer those questions. You should have no problem answering the questions because I know your notes are good. But if, if they saw, if I catch those mistakes, I, I kind of force them to rewatch mm -hmm. it. And it got to a point now where I've, I've really had to hammer ho home where kids are eliciting feedback from me. If I do an activity or an assessment where there's no feedback allowed, they're raising their hands still like, hey, they're like, hey, I need my feedback here. So it's, <laughs> I guess it worked uh, for the most part. <laughs> on that. That is such a good tip. I have never thought about that, but so cool because I think you do have to teach students how to watch a video in an academic setting because it's a little bit different than watching YouTube for enjoyment or scrolling through Netflix and binging your favorite series. So I can almost imagine at the beginning of the year, you have all of these different checkpoints where students have stopped They've raised their hands and you're looking through those notes. 
And as the year progresses, you might even be able to pull back a little bit because they've started to understand exactly what's expected of them. They've started to understand how they watch videos. If you're in a place where students are not just watching the videos, but they're actively watching, right? Because that's exactly what we want in order to promote that deeper learning. Yep, definitely. I love that. I love that as a tip. All right. So before we get out of here, I've got one more question for you. And I think it's going to be a tough one because I know that you spend a lot of time peeking through resources. But if you had to pick one favorite online resource to share with our listeners, what would it be? Oh, man. Uh, We're talking about a place where I go to get learning or a favorite app that I use. Uh, Let's go with a place that you go to get learning. Then then that's a pretty easy one for me, but it, it takes time to learn how to do it, though. But when I first got into this business in 2015, the first, actually, the or one of the originators of Edge Protocols, John Carippo, told me, here's your, here's your advice. He's like, get on Twitter. Mm. All the experts are on there giving away their knowledge for free. That was a watershed moment, not just in my career, but, it, but in my life. I'd been on Twitter for years, you know, following the news, my favorite sport teams and stuff. And I never thought to use it for education. Mm-hmm. And teacher Twitter is just chock full of free stuff. And when I started getting, jumping on Twitter chats, my whole outlook on, on PD changed completely. I, I would get more out of an hour-long Twitter chat than in any district-mandated forced PD that I, I ever got. And I take control of my learning by being on Twitter. A lot of people think, oh, yeah, social media, that, that's not for, for professional. Like, oh, it is. And Facebook has up their game as well because there's tons of Facebook groups for whatever you mm-hmm. want to learn. And there's just support out there. And it's it's an amazing being that connected educator. I, I'm here today having this conversation because I said, yes, I'm going to get on Twitter. Because if I didn't, I wouldn't be here today. I can promise you that. All I've accomplished in the last seven years is directly a result of me deciding to get on, on Twitter and connecting with the thousands of people that I'm following uh, every day. My wife and I met on Twitter. We, what? we, we interacted on Twitter chats. And, and it was, and we were a lot of the same chats together. And then, then we realized, hey, we're both we're both part of Q. And that's how we got to know each other. And we got married on stage at Fall Q in 2018. Wow! And everybody that was in our wedding, it was live streamed on Twitter, on Facebook, and YouTube. And it, it was all because we were connected through Twitter. So I'm not saying that you should try to go. It's going to replace going on Tinder or anything <laughs> else that you like to use. But that worked for me. And like I said, it changed me professionally and personally. Jeez, that is quite a story. So yeah, you heard it here first. If you have not found any luck on Tinder or Bumble, get on Teacher Twitter and maybe your wedding will be live streamed at ISTE in a couple of years. Yeah, uh-huh. like, like Tara, <laughs> like Tara, Tara and David. Yeah, that is, that is really, really awesome. So in all seriousness, Twitter is an awesome resource. And what I love is that it connects you to other resources, right? So resources, not just in people, but also in blogs and books and and all sorts of things that you can grab to learn a lot more. So I appreciate you sharing that tidbit, that life-changing tidbit with our listeners. All right, Adam, I really appreciate you joining EdTech Heroes. Listeners, be sure to follow Adam on Twitter. He is at Tech Coach Juarez, and he's got a lot of great tips to share with y'all. As always, I am your host, Neff Dukes, and I'm looking forward to seeing each and every one of you next time. Thank you for listening to this episode of EdTech Heroes, presented by Screencastify.